The Critique of Practical Reason by Immanuel Kant, translated by Thomas Kingsmill Abbott. Preface. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This work is called The Critique of Practical Reason, not of the pure practical reason, although its parallelism with the speculative critique would seem to require the latter term. The result of this appears sufficiently from the treatise itself. Its business is to show that there is pure practical reason, and for this purpose it criticizes the entire practical faculty of reason. If it succeeds in this, it has no need to criticize the pure faculty itself, in order to see whether reason, in making such a claim, does not presumptuously overstep itself, as is the case with the speculative reason. For if, as practical reason, it is actually practical, it proves its own reality and that of its concepts by fact, and all disputation against the possibility of its being real is futile. With this faculty, transcendental freedom is also established, freedom, namely, in that absolute sense in which speculative reason required it, in its use of the concept of causality, in order to escape the antinomy into which it inevitably falls, when in the chain of cause and effect it tries to think the unconditioned. Speculative reason could only exhibit this concept of freedom problematically, as not impossible to thought, without assuring it any objective reality, and merely lest the supposed impossibility of what it must at least allow to be thinkable should endanger its very being and plunge it into an abyss of scepticism. Inasmuch as the reality of the concept of freedom is proved by an apodeictic law of practical reason, it is the keystone of the whole system of pure reason, even the speculative, and all other concepts, those of God and immorality, which as being mere ideas remain in it unsupported, now attach themselves to this concept, and by it obtain consistence and objective reality, that is to say, their possibility is proved by the fact that freedom actually exists, for this idea is revealed by the moral law. Freedom, however, is the only one of all the ideas of the speculative reason of which we know the possibility a priori, without, however, understanding it, because it is the condition of the moral law which we know. The ideas of God and immortality, however, are not conditions of the moral law, but only conditions of the necessary object of a will determined by this law, that is to say, conditions of the practical use of our pure reason. Hence, with respect to these ideas, we cannot affirm that we know and understand, I will not say the actuality, but even the possibility of them. However they are the conditions of the application of the morally determined will to its object, which is given to it a priori, viz., the summum bonum. Consequently, in this practical point of view, their possibility must be assumed, although we cannot theoretically know and understand it. To justify this assumption it is sufficient, in a practical point of view, that they contain no intrinsic impossibility, contradiction. Here we have what, as far as speculative reason is concerned, is a merely subjective principle of assent, which, however, is objectively valid for a reason equally pure but practical, and this principle, by means of the concept of freedom, assures objective reality and authority to the ideas of God and immorality. Nay, there is a subjective necessity, a need of pure reason, to assume them. Nevertheless, the theoretical knowledge of reason is not hereby enlarged, but only the possibility is given, which heretofore was merely a problem, and now becomes assertion, and thus the practical use of reason is connected with the elements of theoretical reason. And this need is not a merely hypothetical one for the arbitrary purposes of speculation, that we must assume something if we wish in speculation to carry reason to its utmost limits, but it is a need which has the force of law to assume something without which that cannot be, which we must inevitably set before us as the aim of our action. It would certainly be more satisfactory to our speculative reason if it could solve these problems for itself without this circuit and preserve the solution for practical use as a thing to be referred to, but in fact our faculty of speculation is not so well provided. Those who boast of such high knowledge ought not to keep it back, 
but to exhibit it publicly, that it may be tested and appreciated. They want to prove. Very good, let them prove. And the critical philosophy lays its arms at their feet as the victors. Quid status? Nolent. Aqui licit asibatis. As they then do not in fact choose to do so, probably because they cannot, we must take up these arms again, in order to seek, in the mortal use of reason, and to base on this, the notions of God, freedom, and immortality, the possibility of which speculation cannot adequately prove. Here first is explained the enigma of the critical philosophy, viz., how we deny objective reality to the supersensible use of the categories in speculation, and yet admit this reality with respect to the objects of pure practical reason. This must, at first, seem inconsistent, as long as the practical use is only nominally known. But when, by a thorough analysis of it, one becomes aware that the reality spoken of does not imply any theoretical determination of the categories, and extension of our knowledge to the supersensible, but that what is meant is that in this respect an object belongs to them, because either they are contained in the necessary determination of the will a priori, or are insensibly connected with its object, then this inconsistency disappears, because the use we make of these concepts is different from what speculative reason requires. On the other hand, there now appears an unexpected and very satisfactory proof of the consistency of the speculative critical philosophy. For whereas it insisted that the object of experience as such, including our own subject, have only the value of phenomena, while at the same time in themselves must be supposed as their basis, so that not everything supersensible was to be regarded as a fiction, and its concept as empty, so now practical reason itself, without any concert with the speculative, assures reality to a supersensible object of the category of causality, viz., freedom, although, as becomes a practical concept, only for a practical use, and this establishes on the evidence of a fact that which in the former case could only be conceived. By this the strange but certain doctrine of the speculative critical philosophy that the thinking subject is to itself in internal intuition only a phenomenon, obtains in the critical examination of the practical reason its full confirmation, and that so thoroughly that we should be compelled to adopt this doctrine, even if the former had never proved it at all. Which I have as yet met with against the critique turn about these two points, namely, on the one side, the objective reality of the categories as applied to noumena, which is in the theoretical department of knowledge denied, in the practical affirmed, and on the other side, the paradoxical demand to regard oneself qua subject of freedom as a nuomenon, and at the same time, from the point of view of physical nature as a phenomenon, in one's own empirical consciousness. For as long as one has formed no definite notions of morality and freedom, one could not conjecture on the side what was intended to be the nuomenon, the basis of the alleged phenomenon, and on the other side it seemed doubtful whether it was at all possible to form any notion of it, seeing we had previously assigned all the notions of the pure understanding, in its theoretical use, exclusively to phenomenon. Nothing but a detailed criticism of the practical reason can remove all this misapprehension, and set in a clear light the consistency which constitutes its great merit." so much by way of justification of the proceeding, by which, in this work, the notions and principles of pure speculative reason, which have already undergone their special critical examination, are now and then again subject to examination. This would not, in other cases, be in accordance with the systematic process by which a science is established, since matters which have been decided ought only to be cited and not again discussed. In this case, however, it was not only allowable but necessary, because reason is here considered in transition to a different use of these concepts from what it had made of them before. Such a transition necessitates a comparison of the old and the new usage, in order to distinguish well the new path from the old one, and at the same time to allow their connection to be observed. Accordingly, considerations of this kind, including those which are once more directed to the concept of freedom, in the practical use of the pure reason, 
must not be regarded as an interpolation serving only to fill up the gaps in the critical system of speculative reason, for this is for its own purpose complete, or, like the props and buttresses which in a hastily constructed building are often added afterwards, but as true members which make the connection of the system plain, and show us concepts, here presented as real, which there could only be presented problematically. This remark applies especially to the concept of freedom, respecting which one cannot but observe with surprise that so many boast of being able to understand it quite well, and to explain its possibility, while they regard it only psychologically, whereas, if they had studied it in a transcendental point of view, they must have recognized that it is not only indispensable as a problematical concept, in the complete use of speculative reason, but also quite incomprehensible, and that if they afterwards came to consider its practical use, they must needs have come to the very mode of determining the principle of this, to which they are now so loth to assent. The concept of freedom is the stone of stumbling for all empiricists, but at the same time the key to the loftiest practical principles for critical moralists, who perceive by its means that they must necessarily proceed by a rational method. For this reason I beg the reader not to pass lightly over what is said of this concept at the end of the analytic. I must leave it to those who are acquainted with works of this kind to judge whether such a system as that of the practical reason, which here is developed from the critical examination of it, has cost much or little trouble, especially in seeking not to miss the true point of view from which the whole can be rightly sketched. It presupposes, indeed, the fundamental principles of the metaphysic of morals, but only in so far as this gives a preliminary acquaintance with the principle of duty, and assigns and justifies a definite formula thereof. In other respects it is independent. It results from the nature of this practical faculty itself that the complete classification of all practical sciences cannot be added, as in the critique of the speculative reason for it is not possible to define duties specially, as human duties, with a view to their classification, until the subject of this definition, viz., man, is known according to his actual nature, at least so far as is necessary with respect to duty. This, however, does not belong to a critical examination of the practical reason, the business of which is only to assign, in a complete manner, the principles of its possibility, extent, and limits, without special reference to human nature. The classification, then, belongs to the system of science, not to the system of criticism. In the second part of the analytic I have given, as I trust, a sufficient answer to the objection of a truth-loving and acute critic of the fundamental principles of the metaphysic of morals, a critic always worthy of respect to the objection, namely, that the notion of good was not established before the moral principle, as he thinks it ought to have been. I have also had regard to many of the objections which have reached me from men who show that they have at heart the discovery of the truth, and I shall continue to do so, for those who have only their old system before their eyes, and who have already settled what is to be approved or disapproved, do not desire any explanation which might stand in the way of their own private opinion. I have no fear, as regards this treatise, of the reproach that I wish to introduce a new language since the sort of knowledge here in question has itself somewhat of an everyday character. Nor, even in the case of the former critique, could this reproach occur to any one who had thought it through, and not merely turned over the leaves. To invent new words, where language has no lack of expressions for given notions, is a childish effort to distinguish oneself from the crowd, if not by new and true thoughts, yet by new patches on the old garment." If, therefore, the readers of that work know any more familiar expressions which are as suitable to the thought as those seem to me to be, or if they think they can show the futility of these thoughts themselves, and hence that of the expression, they would in the first case very much oblige me, for I only desire to be understood, and in the second case they would deserve well of philosophy. But as long as these thoughts stand, I very much doubt that suitable, and yet more common expressions for them can be found. In this manner, then, the a priori principles of two faculties of the mind, the faculty of cognition and that of desire, would be found and determined as to the conditions, extent, and limits of their use, 
and thus a sure foundation be paid for a scientific system of philosophy, both theoretic and practical. Nothing worse could happen to these labours than that any one should make the unexpected discovery that there neither is, nor can be, any a priori knowledge at all. But there is no danger of this. This would be the same thing as if one sought to prove by reason that there is no reason. For we only say that we know something by reason, when we are conscious that we could have known it, even if it had not been given to us in experience. Hence, rational knowledge and knowledge a priori are one and the same. It is a clear contradiction to try to extract necessity from a principle of experience, ex pumise aquam, and to try by this to give a judgment true universality, without which there is no rational inference, not even inference from analogy, which is at least a presumed universality and objective necessity. To substitute subjective necessity, that is, custom, for objective, which exists only in a priori judgments, is to deny to reason the power of judging about the object, i.e. of knowing it, and what belongs to it. It implies, for example, that we must not say of something, which often or always follows a certain antecedent state, that we can conclude from this to that, for this would imply objective necessity and the notion of an a priori connection, but only that we may expect similar cases, just as animals do, that is, that we reject the notion of cause altogether as false and a mere delusion. As to attempting to remedy this want of objective and consequently universal validity by saying that we can see no ground for attributing any other sort of knowledge to other rational beings, if this reasoning were valid, our ignorance would do more for the enlargement of our knowledge than all our meditation. For then, on this very ground that we have no knowledge of any other rational beings besides man, we should have a right to suppose them to be of the same nature as we know ourselves to be. That is, we should really know them. I omit to mention that universal assent does not prove the objective validity of a judgment, i.e., its validity as a cognition, and although this universal assent should accidentally happen, it could furnish no proof of agreement with the object, on the contrary, it is the objective validity which alone constitutes the basis of a necessary universal consent. Hume would be quite satisfied with this system of universal empiricism, for, as is well known, he desired nothing more than that, instead of inscribing any objective meaning to the necessity in the concept of a cause, a merely subjective one should be assumed, viz., custom, in order to deny that reason could judge about God, freedom, and immortality, and if once his principles were granted, he was certainly well able to deduce his conclusions therefrom, with all logical coherence. But even Hume did not make his empiricism so universal as to include mathematics. He holds the principles of mathematics to be analytical, and if his were correct, they would certainly be apodeictic also. But we would not infer from this that the reason has the faculty of forming apodeictic judgments in philosophy also, that is to say, those which are synthetical judgments, like the judgment of causality. But if we adopt a universal empiricism, then mathematics will be included. Now, if this science is in contradiction with a reason that admits only empirical principles, as it inevitably is in the antimony in which mathematics prove the infinite divisibility of space, which empiricism cannot admit, then the greatest possible evidence of demonstration is in manifest contradiction with the alleged conclusions from experience, and we are driven to ask, like Chelsidon's blind patient, which deceives me, sight or touch? For empiricism is based on a necessity felt, rationalism on a necessity seen. And thus universal empiricism reveals itself as absolute skepticism, it is erroneous to attribute this in such an unqualified sense to Hume, since he left at least one certain touchstone, which can only be found in a priori principles, although experience consists not only of feelings, but also of judgments. However, as in this philosophical and critical age such empiricism can scarcely be serious, and it is probably put forward only as an intellectual exercise, and for the purpose of putting in a clearer light, by contrast, the necessity of rational a priori principles, we can only be grateful to those who employ themselves in this otherwise uninstructive labor. End of preface.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To learn more, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Translated by J. M. D. Meeklejohn Preface to the First Edition, 1781 Read by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, January 2007. Human reason, in one sphere of its cognition, is called upon to consider questions which it cannot decline as they are presented by its own nature, but which it cannot answer as they transcend every faculty of the mind. It falls into this difficulty without any fault of its own. It begins with principles, which cannot be dispensed with in the field of experience, and the truth and sufficiency of which are, at the same time, ensured by experience. With these principles it rises, in obedience to the laws of its own nature, to ever higher and more remote conditions. But it quickly discovers that in this way its labors must remain ever incomplete, because new questions never cease to present themselves and thus it finds itself compelled to have recourse to principles which transcend the region of experience, while they are regarded by common sense without distrust. It thus falls into confusion and contradictions, from which it conjectures the presence of latent errors which, however, it is unable to discover, because the principles it employs, transcending the limits of experience, cannot be tested by that criterion. The area of these endless contests is called metaphysic. Time was when she was the queen of all the sciences, and, if we take the will for the deed, she certainly deserved, so far as regards the high importance of her object matter, this title of honor. Now it is the fashion of the time to heap contempt and scorn upon her, and the matron mourns forlorn and forsaken like Hecuba. Quote, Modo maxima rerum, to generis natic potens, nunc trio uxot onopa. Ovid Metamorphosis. Translation But laid on the pinnacle of fame, strong in my many sons, now exiled, penniless. End translation and footnote. At first, her government under the administration of the dogmatist was an absolute despotism. But, as the legislative continued to show traces of the ancient barbaric rule, her empire gradually broke up, and the intestine wars introduced the reign of anarchy, while the skeptics, like nomadic tribes who hate a permanent habitation and settled mode of living, attacked from time to time those who had organized themselves into civil communities. But their number was very happily small, and thus they could not entirely put a stop to the exertions of those who persisted in raising new edifices, although on no settled or uniform plan. In recent times the hope dawned upon us of seeing those disputes settled, and the legitimacy of her claims established by a kind of physiology of the human understanding, that of the celebrated Locke. But it was found that although it was affirmed that this so-called queen could not refer her descent to any higher source than that of common experience, a circumstance which necessarily brought suspicion on her claims, as this genealogy was incorrect, she persisted in the advancement of her claims to sovereignty. Thus, metaphysics necessarily fell back into the antiquated and rotten constitution of dogmatism and again became obnoxious to the contempt from which efforts had been made to save it. At present, as all methods according to the general persuasion have been tried in vain, there reigns naught but weariness and complete indifferentism, the mother of chaos and night in the scientific world, but at the same time the source of, or at least the prelude to, the recreation and reinstallation of a science, when it has fallen into confusion, obscurity, and disuse from ill-directed effort. For it is in reality vain to profess indifference in regard to such inquiries, 
the object of which cannot be indifferent to humanity. Besides, these pretended indifferentists, however much they may try to disguise themselves by the assumption of a popular style, and by changes on the language of the schools, unavoidably fall into metaphysical declarations and propositions, which they profess to regard with so much contempt. At the same time, this indifference, which has arisen in the world of science, and which relates to that kind of knowledge which we should wish to see destroyed the last, is a phenomena that well deserves our attention and reflection. It is plainly not the effect of the levity, but of the mature judgment of the age, which refuses to be any longer entertained with illusory knowledge. It is, in fact, a call to reason, again to undertake the most laborious of all tasks, that of self-examination, and to establish a tribunal which may secure it in its well-grounded claims, while it pronounces against all baseless assumptions and pretensions, not in an arbitrary manner, but according to its own eternal and unchangeable laws. This tribunal is nothing less than the critical investigation of pure reason. I do not mean by this a criticism of books and systems, but a critical inquiry into the faculty of reason, with reference to the cognitions to which it strives to attain without the aid of experience. In other words, the solution of the question regarding the possibility or impossibility of metaphysics, and the determination of the origin as well as of the extent and limits of this science. All this must be done on the basis of principles. The path, the only one now remaining, has been entered upon by me, and I flatter myself that I have in this way discovered the cause of, and consequently the mode of removing, all the errors which have hitherto set reason at variance with itself, in the sphere of non-empirical thought. I have not returned an evasive answer to the questions of reason by alleging the inability and limitation of the faculties of the mind. I have, on the contrary, examined them completely in the light of principles, and, after having discovered the cause of the doubts and contradictions into which reason fell, have solved them to its perfect satisfaction. It is true these questions have not been solved as dogmatism in its vain fancies and desires, had expected. For it can only be satisfied by the exercise of magical arts, and of these I have no knowledge. But neither do these come within the compass of our mental powers, and it was the duty of philosophy to destroy the illusions which had their origin in misconceptions, whatever darling hopes and valued expectations may be ruined by its explanations. My chief aim in this work has been thoroughness, and I make bold to say that there is not a single metaphysical problem that does not find its solution, or at least a key to its solution, here. Pure reason is a perfect unity, and therefore, if the principle presented by it prove to be insufficient for the solution of even a single one of these questions to which the very nature of reason gives birth, we must reject it, as we could not be perfectly certain of its insufficiency in the case of the others. While I say this, I think I see upon the countenance of the reader signs of dissatisfaction mingled with contempt, when he hears declarations which sound so boastful and extravagant, and yet they are beyond comparison more moderate than those advanced by the commonest author of the commonest philosophical program, in which the dogmatist professes to demonstrate the simple nature of the soul, or the necessity of a primal being. Such a dogmatist promises to extend human knowledge beyond the limits of possible experience, while I humbly confess that this is completely beyond my power. Instead of any such attempt, I confine myself to the examination of reason alone and its pure thought, and I do not need to seek far for the sum total of its cognition, because it has its seat in my own mind. Besides, Common logic presents me with a complete and systematic catalogue of all the simple operations of reason, and it is my task to answer the question of how far reason can go without the material presented and the aid furnished by experience. So much for the completeness and thoroughness necessary in the execution of the present task. The aims set before us are not arbitrarily proposed, 
but are imposed upon us by the nature of cognition itself. The above remarks relate to the matter of our critical inquiry. As regards the form, there are two indispensable conditions which anyone who undertakes so difficult a task as that of a critique of pure reason is bound to fulfill. These conditions are certitude and clearness. As regards certitude, I have fully convinced myself that, in this sphere of thought, opinion is perfectly inadmissible, and that everything which bears the least semblance of a hypothesis must be excluded, as of no value in such discussions. For it is a necessary condition of every cognition that is to be established upon a priori grounds that it shall be held to be absolutely necessary. Much more is this the case with an attempt to determine all pure a priori cognition, and to furnish the standard, and consequently an example, of all apodictic parentheses, philosophical end parentheses, certitude. Whether I have succeeded in what I profess to do, it is for the reader to determine. It is the author's business merely to adduce grounds and reasons without determining what influence these ought to have on the mind of his judges. But, lest anything he may have said may become the innocent cause of doubt in their minds, or tend to weaken the effect which his arguments might otherwise produce, he may be allowed to point out those passages which may occasion mistrust or difficulty, although these do not concern the main purpose of the present work. He does this solely with the view of removing from the mind of the reader any doubts which might affect his judgment of the work as a whole, and in regard to its ultimate aim. I know no investigations more necessary for a full insight into the nature of the faculty which we call understanding, and at the same time for the determination of the rules and limits of its use, than those undertaken in the second chapter of the Transcendental Analytic, under the title of Deduction of the Pure Conceptions of the Understanding. And they have cost me by far the greatest labor, labor which, I hope, will not remain uncompensated. The view there taken, which goes somewhat deeply into the subject, has two sides. The one relates to the objects of the pure understanding, and is intended to demonstrate and to render comprehensible the objected validity of its a priori conceptions, and it forms, for this reason, an essential part of the critique. The other considers the pure understanding itself, its possibility and its powers of cognition, that is, from a subjective point of view, and although this exposition is of great importance, it does not belong essentially to the main purpose of the work, because the grand question is, what and how much can reason and understanding, apart from experience, cognize, and not, how is the faculty of thought itself possible? As the latter is an inquiry into the cause of a given effect, and has thus in it some semblance of a hypothesis, although, as I shall show on another occasion, this is really not the fact, it would seem that, in the present instance, I had allowed myself to announce a mere opinion and that the reader must therefore be at liberty to hold a different opinion. But I beg to remind him that, if my subjective deduction does not produce in his mind the conviction of its certitude at which I aimed, the objective deduction, with which alone the present work is properly concerned, is in every respect satisfactory. As regards clearness, the reader has a right to demand, in the first place, discursive or logical clearness that is, on the basis of conceptions, and secondly, intuitive or aesthetic clearness, by means of intuitions, that is, by examples or other modes of illustration, in concreto. I have done what I could for the first kind of intelligibility. This was essential to my purpose, and thus became the accidental cause of my inability to do complete justice to the second requirement. I have been almost always at a loss, during the progress of this work, how to settle this question. Examples and illustrations always appeared to me necessary, and, in the first sketch of the critique, naturally fell into their proper places. But I very soon became aware of the magnitude of my task, 
and the numerous problems with which I should be engaged, and, as I perceived that this critical investigation would, even if delivered in the driest scholastic manner, be far from being brief, I found it inadvisable to enlarge it still more with examples and explanations, which are necessary only from a popular point of view. I was induced to take this course from the consideration also that the present work is not intended for popular use, that those devoted to science do not require such helps, although they are always acceptable, and that they would have materially interfered with my present purpose. Abby Terrison remarks with great justice that if we estimate the size of a work not from the number of its pages, but from the time which we require to make ourselves master of it, it may be said of many a book that it would be much shorter if it were not so short. On the other hand, as regards the comprehensibility of a system of speculative cognition connected under a single principle, we may say with equal justice. Many a book would have been much clearer if it had not been intended to be so very clear. For explanations and examples and other helps to intelligibility aid us in the comprehension of parts, but they distract the attention, dissipate the mental power of the reader, and stand in the way of his forming a clear conception of the whole, as he cannot attain soon enough to a survey of the system, and the coloring and embellishments bestowed upon it prevent his observing its articulation or organization, which is the most important consideration with him when he comes to judge of its unity and stability. The reader must naturally have a strong inducement to cooperate with the present author, if he has formed the intention of erecting a complete and solid edifice of metaphysical science according to the plan now laid before him. Metaphysics, as here represented, is the only science which admits of completion, and with little labor if it is united in a short time, so that nothing will be left to future generations except the task of illustrating and applying it didactically. For this science is nothing more than the inventory of all that is given us by pure reason, systematically arranged. Nothing can escape our notice. For what reason produces from itself cannot lie concealed, but must be brought to light by reason itself, so soon as we have discovered the common principle of the ideas that we seek. The perfect unity of this kind of cognitions, which are based upon pure conceptions and uninfluenced by any empirical element or any peculiar intuition leading to determinate experience, renders this completeness not only practicable, but also necessary. Tecum habita and noriquam siti bicoto superlex, Perseus. Translation Dwell within yourself, and you will know how short your household stuff is. And translation and footnote. Such a system of pure speculative reason I hope to be able to publish under the title of Metaphysic of Nature. The content of this work, which will not be half so long, will be very much richer than that of the present critique, which has to discover the sources of this cognition and expose the conditions of its possibility, and at the same time to clear and level a fit foundation for the scientific edifice. In the present work, I look for the patient hearing and impartiality of a judge, in the other, for the goodwill and assistance of a co-laborer. For, however complete the list of principles for this system may be in the critique, the correctness of the system requires that no deduced conceptions should be absent. These cannot be presented a priori, but must be gradually discovered. And, while the synthesis of conceptions has been fully exhausted in the critique, it is necessary that, in the proposed work, the same should be the case with their analysis. But this will be rather an amusement than a labor. End of Critique of Pure Reason, Section 1, Preface to the First Edition, 1781, recorded by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, January 2007.